Yes, so um, thank you for the warm uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Marcus Olsen. Uh, I work as a data engineer at Bonnier Broadcasting in Stockholm. And uh, we build the, I don't know if you heard of us, but we do the TV4 Play and see more streaming services here in Sweden. And we're, we've been doing Go for uh, uh, some years back now. Uh, we're doing a microservice architecture where most of our services are written in Go and a few of them in, uh, in Elixir as well. We're running about 30 services, uh, or, or I think there's more, but there's uh, 30 documented uh, uses of, of, uh, of uh, Go and Elixir. So uh, a little bit about me. I've been using Go for as my primary language for a little bit more than four years. I'm also the organizer of the meetups in Stockholm. And I've been also recently uh, doing more of training, Go training and workshops uh, for, for diversity purposes and, and um, well, uh, heading out to, uh, to companies in Stockholm and do, uh, to get people into Go, basically. And uh, so I was thinking what we could uh, talk about for this, uh, this meetup. Uh, and we, we agreed upon testing could be a, good, a cool uh, subject. So uh, I have some slides for you, uh, but I usually uh, like to have uh, more of a, like a discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that will work with the video format, but if you have any questions or thoughts during the talk, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I will try to uh, repeat the question uh, for the camera, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, if I don't, uh, please remind me. Cool. Uh, so, uh, first of all, how many in here has uh, started learning Go within uh, the last year? Okay. Uh, the last two years? Okay. And the last three years? Okay. So, so uh, that's about the drop-off point then. Uh, how many in here has uh, have written a test in Go? Okay, cool. That's that's good to know. Uh, hopefully, there will be something new for all of you. Uh, I won't guarantee it, but I have tried my best. So in Go, just to start off, uh, the way you write a test is that you create this file underscore test.go in the the package that you're trying to test, and then you just use the, the Go tool that has a subcommand called test, and that will run all the tests that are formatted like this uh, in those test files. And with the verbose flag, this is how it could look, uh, given the, the test that we have on the right-hand side here, or the left-hand side if you're watching this. Um, so typically you see a a function in your underscore test file that starts with test, upperscore, uh, um, uppercase uh, T. And then that will take a test struct or a, test, a testing struct with the, that gives you uh, some functionalities related to, to your tests. And the typical way you would do it is that you would have uh, your input and then you specify your expected output and then you run the actual function that you're, you're looking to test, your system on the test, if you will. And in Go, you would typically uh, use a if-based assertion. Uh, we'll get more into these uh, uh, along the way. Um, and then uh, you, you check uh, whether a condition is met or not. So far, basic stuff, uh, but I think it's good to have a common ground. Um, so this is, most of uh, your tests will probably look something like this. Uh, not black, uh, I hope. They will be colorful and uh, passing. Cool. Cool. So, before I get into uh, more of the, the, the techniques I'm going to show you, uh, I just want to uh, make a few notes on f testing frameworks, um, because there are a few. And if you're coming from a language like Java or C++, 
or even JavaScript, you most likely have heard of like JUnit or NUnit or RSpec or a bunch of these uh, testing frameworks, uh, frameworks that you probably have some experience with. And so when you start off with Go, you might want to start Googling or you might start Googling for the best testing framework in Go. And this is understandable because that's what you've basically been doing for all these other languages. But what you might not be familiar with is that Go has an excellent testing package in the standard library. And in fact, most of the time, the standard package, uh, uh, the testing package in the standard library, library will be more than enough for your purposes. And while well, there are a couple of testing frameworks out there that might make sense, um, I think you're actually, um, a lot of the time you're better off with the st standard library, but there are cases where I assume that they could be better for your purposes. So I won't say don't use frameworks, but I say limit their use because it's basically another dependency in your application just from the get-go. Um, so you might think uh, want to think about that. So for the remainder of this talk, I will uh, I will focus on the testing package from the standard library. Okay. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't uh, good uh, frameworks out there. There are, but I will limit myself. Uh, I would try to, uh, I have actually made a example application that I could, uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, to switch back and forth. Uh, in fact, I think if we have it here, yes, uh, I will try to, uh, all right, <laughs> uh, let's do it like this. So I think now it's on the other side. No, that's fine. Uh, I will actually, um, I will do it like this. I will double the screen instead, like that. Cool. Uh, so my example application will be something like this. Actually, we'll, we'll start off with that. So it's a very uh, basic application. It's a web service. Uh, you have a a uh, command of uh, a server part here uh, defined at the main.go. And then you have a bunch of packages in here. Don't worry, I will explain what the purposes of them as we go along. Uh, but there is also, I've pushed this to uh, GitHub so you can follow along if you have a, a laptop with you. Um, it's actually available at, uh, yeah, I have the, the one open here. So it's Marcus Olson slash cart. Uh, it's basically a shopping application to put stuff in your uh, shopping cart. And I will try to use it uh, as we go along. Um, no, that's, so actually let's, so where's my other one? There it is. Cool. Uh, so for the, uh, this presentation, I was I was thinking that we could do like a, a showcase of some of the common testing techniques, and uh, all of them will look something like this: uh, that you have uh, the technique or the the strategy, and then uh, when you would want to use this technique, and if you have this uh, use case, then you do something like what's under the 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 next uh, subheader. So in the case that I was showing you in the example, we have the normal, the typical case where you have a condition that you want to test for. And the way you do this is that you test a condition and then you use one of the methods available on the testing struct, the, this one from the, te the, the testing package. And there's basically two methods that are the most interesting to you, I would say. There are uh, the error and the fatal method which are available as a, um, you can pass a formatting directive as well. So here we have fatal F and you can pass um, a, a, a basically error string that will output, uh, will be outputted when the test fail basically. And the, the difference between the error method and the fatal method, method is that uh, the error method will, will mark the test as fail, but it will continue execution. 
whereas the fatal method will just halt your test right there. So that might be, uh, so you might want to choose between them. For example, if you get an error from, from you, uh, not, uh, your package, for example, and everything uh, beyond that is undefined, then you would typically use fatal because there's no use in continuing from there on. But if you want to check, for example, um, a, a set of fields, for example, then you would normally use error because uh, if you have an, um, if you have um, a failure in one of these checks, if you use fatal, th that's the only check that will show in the output. So then you fix that, but then you realize that, well, the next check also fails, and the next one, and the next one. So you instead use error uh, to get all the, the failed checks in one go, basically. Does it make sense? Um, you've been using it, uh, I'm guessing, for, for the better t part of your testing purposes in Go, I'm assuming, but um, yeah. There are a couple of other uh, methods on the testing struct that can be useful, like there's uh, the method log that can provide you with output that will, won't fail your test, basically. So like informative uh, tests, basically. There's some stuff in there to make your test parallel, skipping tests and a bunch of stuff. I rarely use them, so I won't uh, bring them up here. Um, I should say that the, the slides I have here are the things that I am mainly using on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so I won't, I won't stand here and tell you this is how you should do it and I'm not doing it myself. So I, I try to, to preach uh, as, I, as I actually do it myself. But you might have the case where you're making uh, a lot of this if statements, right? You're polluting your entire test with all these checks and eventually will be, become more uh, difficult to, to actually see what the test is doing. Uh, so you might want to uh, extract the check or the, the, the assertion into another, another function. So in that case, we will make a more compact test case here, for example. So we test that um, if the output from 2Camel here with that given input will output this one. And the, the, it's the exact same check as we saw in the, in the previous slide. But in this case, we're testing multiple uh, conditions here, or we're asserting them. And what's, I what's interesting here, though, and something that's been added recently in 1.9, is this method. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, then it's basically a way of... Um, so if you, if you remove this line, when you run your test and one, the, this one in the middle fails, the test will actually say that the test failed here, which is not useful at all. Uh, so you, you have no idea which one of these three, three that actually failed. So what the helper does is that it actually will discard this function call uh, in the test, basically, for the output. So that means that your test, if it fails, you will see this line in the output instead. Yeah. I, I won't, um, I don't know if it's actually removed from the, the stack trace or if it's just a, a convenience thing in the output. I don't, I'm not sure if it, if it works like that uh, under the surface, but but it, it's a it's a very nice th a nice thing if you're using these helpers. I usually don't uh, um, create a, uh, um, a helper uh, test helpers uh, like these ones. Uh, I I typically just have the if case. But if you have more complex uh, um, assertions that you want to do at multiple places, for example, if you want to compare two JSON objects, for example, or JSON strings that might be a bit more involved, and so you might want to extract that um, into its own method. Uh, but uh, the star, uh, the, it's a bit small text there, but what I'm basically uh, saying there is that in this case, these are actually three different tests, right? This test is doing a lot more than one thing. So you might just uh, uh, extract these to the different test cases instead. So. Uh, be aware of test helpers, I would say, because they encourage you to, to uh, fit more into one test case. Um, 
so that that's a uh, beware of that. Uh, this one, yes. So this this prefix is necessary for the, your test to to uh, to work. Test something, and so if we if we look at this one, um, yeah. So you will get the test here, and actually, um, I will. What you can do is that. Um, So in the in the in this case, for example, I can also do this a convenient thing. In this case, it's actually let's let's try a bit uh, this one maybe. I think this one has more test cases. Yeah. So what you can do is that you can also uh, use the the this argument. Oh, it's very small. So the the dash run, and then you can actually I think you can actually do like this, and we'll yeah, and we'll only run. That test, so you can, uh, if you if you have a lot of tests and you want to make sure that only one is running, the one that you're testing, that could be a cool thing to, to use, basically. Yeah, yeah. So you can do a, a lot of cool stuff. I've never used like the the more advanced regex for this. Usually, it's just I want to isolate to one test, right? Because when you type go test, you will run all the tests in your in that directory. And whereas, whereas I'm probably working on one single test at one given time, so it's just one. But you, as you say, you can like filter out which test you, you want to run. Um, cool, great, thanks for the question. Uh, so uh, if you feel the need for it, create them. Beware though that you might be um, covering a smelly code. The next technique, um, actually, uh, yeah, so uh, what I could show you probably is that uh, I had, yeah, so here we have in the, in the example application, we have a, a, a real world example. Um, of how it could look like. I usually um, do uh, name my tests something like this, where you have like the test suite, uh, like test order, and then underscore, and then the actual type of test you want to do. Uh, so um, in this case, we only have one test here, but it's uh, it's basically the same thing. And here we have um, here I've actually created a test helper that takes an interface. Uh, so that's another like. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, like downside, but you're losing uh, like type security um, uh, when you do uh, helpers like this. They might be convenient, but you should really try to specify the thing that you actually want to test. But this uh, could be like, in, and, and here as well, we need to, this, um, uh, actually let's skip that, that it's too detailed. Uh, so uh, this is a very generic test helper and you might want to create more specific ones. Right. Cool. So the next thing is the underscore test package. Um, this is actually a quite neat thing because uh, you might know this, but you can't uh, have multiple packages in the same directory. Go, uh, Go will complain when building uh, and that will say that, well, you have this package in, the, in this directory and you have this one. So you can't, um, you, that won't compile. But for testing purposes, you can, however, add uh, or append underscore test to uh, your package in your test file. And what this will uh, do is that it will put all your tests in a separate package and this might be convenient when you want you don't want to test internal functions, for example, package local functions. So in this uh, in this example, you will only test the public API of the package. Uh, I do this sometimes, but uh, in uh, in practice, uh, I I use it very limit uh, like limited. Um, 
I think there are cases for testing internal functions. I don't think it's a hard, fast rule that you should only test your API, um, especially since I'm, I'm often doing a test-driven development and I'm doing it even for internal functions as well. And that way I would constantly be switching back, uh, back and forth the, uh, the, the package name. And I'm not sure if I, if I feel like, it's basically if you don't feel like you, like you have the discipline to, to uh, um, if you're, if you're uh, overly testing your uh, internal functions, like short, short lived functions basically that you will end up re removing or rewriting all the tests because they're really not um, the purpose of your, uh, your package or they're just like a helper thing that will maybe get removed uh, fairly um, um, in the future. So uh, this is a way to avoid brittle tests, uh, but again, um, Use it. Uh, I use it sparingly. Uh, sparingly, you don't have to. Um, cool. I th um, I don't, I'm not sure. I. So in this case, for example, we have a, a package called client here, and we uh, we apply this um, pattern here, uh, which means that I have to import the the. The package, even though I'm in the actual package, I still need to import it because that way your tests will only be. Uh, they are pretty much how you would use the uh, the um, the package as a user. Right. So uh, table tests. This is actually one of my favorite uh, patterns in Go, uh, and it's. If you Google like testing patterns in in um, for Go, this is one of the the first things that come up. It's a very commonly used. Uh, it's used throughout the entire standard library, uh, and the reason why it's called a table test is that you're basically doing like this test matrix, where each column is either an input or an output, and each row in the table is a test. So here you would create a a slice of these anonymous structs um, that are, these are basically the columns, if you if you will. Uh, and here we have we're testing a, a function here that just uh, returns whether or not this is an even number or not. So in this case, we can set up a table here uh, that says that well, minus one that's not an even number, zero yes that's an even number, and you can just go on like this. And so it becomes really simple to uh, to add new test cases, right? Because you just copy this line and, and paste it underneath the one that you were on. Uh, and if you have like functions that uh, are, you contains a lot of conditionals or you want to do like very exhaustive testing of your function, or you might have bugs and you want to make sure that you, you save all the regressions or you av avoid all the uh, regressions, for example, then you would uh, basically put all your your bug cases uh, in that table basically and what you then do is that you do a for loop and range over uh, these test cases and then you would have your your input as an object here on that one and this is sort of what we saw before. We still have the conditional and we still have uh, the fatal uh, statement. But we're testing, instead of having uh, more many tests that w what we could have done is that we could create like an, an entire test function for all these cases, right? But they would, I mean, the name would be something like t test uh, is even minus or test even zero, test even one, and so on and so forth. It will be become a lot of, like, it would be very verbose. Uh, and so this is really nice if you want to test a uh, lot of inputs, basically. Yeah. No, no, this is all you. There's no library. I mean, there's probably some library that does this uh, more simply, but I mean, th to me, this, I mean, 
the 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 trick here is the like the anonymous struct here you can create a like a test struct if you if you want to uh, like an uh, object that contains this one and name it but um i mean you you can still access the fields down here so uh, it's more convenient to write it like this Yes, good point. That was well, actually something I was going to uh, mention. Uh, so in this case, since this is the same test, if this one fails, you're not going to execute the other ones. So you're not going to test the other ones. And so you might put error F here instead. And then you would eventually get like all the failed tests in here. But what if you actually, um, I mean, sometimes you want to use fatal. Right, so um, there is uh, from I think version 1.7 there is a better way to to do this. Uh, so uh, I before 1.7 I think uh, I I wrote all my table tests like this, but from from 1.7 and on, there's something called subtests. Uh, is it how many in here have heard about subtests before? Okay, cool, great. So a subtest is a test that runs within a test. I know, right? It's mind blowing. Uh, and you can, you can go on like this forever. You can just nest tests all the way, basically. It's turtles all the way down. And um, when would you use this? Well, the, so the key here is the, this line right here. So on, is this too small? Yeah? Cool. Uh, so on the, the testing uh, object, the test object here, uh, there's a new method called run. Uh, and that the first argument will be the name of the test. You don't have to supply, you can supply an empty string and that way it will be enumerated. So all the ones that with the same, uh, with the same empty string will be enumerated in the test output. Uh, but you can you can actually pass like for example if you actually want to name your tests in here you can add, add another name field up here for example and then pass it to this run method and what you do then is that you you pass a an anonymous function uh, with the same signature as as you have up here so this becomes its own independent test right. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that this will run independently of all the other subtests. So it will, it, you can you can use fatal in here, and all the other ones will just continue to work. They will just go on um, like you would um, if you had written these as in a separate tests, basically. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Good point. Uh, I could. There's no, yeah, I could very easily do that. Uh, for example, here uh, on, on the line here, I could add, for example, t dot parallel, and I would make all these tests run in parallel, basically. Um, I I almost never use parallel. Uh, if you have a lot of of tests, then maybe it would make sense uh, for it. Um, yeah, I, I I just don't use it that much, but definitely you could if you have a lot of them, uh, or if you're trimming down seconds or milliseconds on your, your actual test suite, basically. But that, yeah, so what you could do is that you could have, for example, uh, you can have like pipelined tests. So you can have a, a one parent test here, and then you can have like um, four tests that run in parallel, but then it will wait for um, uh, the, then you can have four, new tests, subtests that will wait for the first four, for example. So you can run like uh, things in parallel, but you can you can also have like a pipeline. So you only start when all those four are done, basically. You can do a lot of stuff with this. Uh, this is the main um, use case that I'm using it for. Uh, I have been experimenting with uh, using subtests for like BDD style testing. So w where you do, for example, in your in your topmost test, you would do like given, and then uh, you have uh, like your uh, test input, and then when you do something, and then then 
uh, you uh, check for these assertions or do make these assertions. So then you would have very nice uh, test output, basically. So given that you have this object, when I uh, book a new uh, car, uh, book a new cargo or place another order, I would expect this to happen, for example, uh, because there are testing frameworks that will let you do this. Uh, there's like Go Convey or Go Mega and other uh, frameworks that will uh, basically change how you write your tests so that you can get this BDD style instead. But with subtests, you definitely can do it with the, st the standard library instead. This is, this, I mean, when I first saw table tests, it was, I mean, it took me a while. So if you, if you don't, like, if you don't get it at, at like, just seeing the slide, don't worry. Uh, when you actually start writing these yourselves, you will see that it's actually quite nice. Um, actually, actually, nowadays, uh, even though I'm, I'm not sure if I will need like uh, a bunch of tests, typically I will write a table test simply because it's so easy uh, and it's so easy to add new, um, new uh, cases, basically. It's just um, often I will uh, convert it to a table test in any case. Cool. And so what you can do, for example, is that in, 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 in um, here, for example, we have uh, uh, a test that, for example, looks something like this. So we have a test create order, and then I have a subtest that um, actually it's better. This one is better because here I have like a test suite of a uh, bunch of tests that uh, list or test my handler for listing orders, basically. And so in this case, I, uh, I want to test that it should return a 200 when the order was found, or there was an order, basically. Uh, but here I have another subtest that checks uh, that it should return 404 when there wasn't any uh, orders uh, or matching the, the, that ID, basically. And so these two are are written in the same um, same test. So I what I could you could do is that I could extract commonly used uh, test inputs uh, like here that can be used in both of my subtests basically. So for the next testing technique, I was this is actually a more involved. Um, this is a vault technique, and this is something you probably are used to from other languages. It's basically um, when you have uh, your code is depending on, for example, a database or something like a heavy dependency that you don't want to set up for your unit test, basically. It could be an uh, event queue, like a message bus. Uh, it could be a database. It could be a lot of things. Uh, but the point is, you don't want to uh, set up an entire database to just run a unit test. Um, so instead, during your unit test, unless you're actually testing uh, the, the connection to the database, obviously. Um, but but in, in the case where you have, for example, a, a, a HTTP handler, a server, and you want to... Um, you, that handler is basically retrieving a user and doing something with that user. But the handler doesn't really care where it gets that user from, right? So that is the, 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 what we're trying to aiming for here. So we want to make our unit tests lean and mean, and we don't want them to be relying on uh, dependencies that might fail for like um, no apparent reason. So we want deterministic tests, basically. Uh, are you able to see this, or should, I, I can actually uh, make them a bit bigger? Uh, so, so uh, what you, you what you do then is that let's start with this one. So in this case, uh, we define a. So in, uh, let's start here, for example. Actually, uh, so in this case, we have. Uh, how many in here have, have written a HTTP handler before, or like a web service? Okay, a few. Cool. This is actually, uh, this is implementing a interface in Go um, that is an HTTP handler. 
So any any um, uh, struct that has this method can receive traffic, HTTP traffic, basically. And in this case, where where our handler is doing something that requires us to grab a value based on a key. So we have a key value store, basically. And that could be Redis, it could be Postgres, it could be a lot of things. It could be like um, just, uh, just a, a file on desk, basically, like Bolt. Uh, it's a very commonly used uh, Go uh, database, actually. Uh, so the point here is that this one accesses uh, a, a, a store of uh, keys and values, um, but we don't really care about where it does get those key or keys and values from. So we define this interface that returns a string uh, for a given key. Again, stop me if I'm going too fast here. Uh, and then we add that as a field in our handler or our, our server object, basically. Which means that inside our handler here, we can we can access the the store object uh, or store field, basically. Uh, so it, this is uh, this is our application code, basically. Uh, which is uh, nowhere here are you seeing any dependencies on Redis, for example. You're only defining the operation to retrieve a value based on a key. So then you would, uh, in your test case instead, let's see if we can scale this, scale this up. So in your test then, you would create a struct that implements the, the key value store that you saw from here. And then uh, you, you create that in your test and then uh, assign that to that field. And since it's, it, got, it has this method, you will be able to assign it to, to that field, basically. And um, what's happening here is actually a quite nice thing uh, that I like to do. Uh, so in my this is my like this is my store of or my mock store or test I think it's actually a fake or a spy possibly I'm not sure with the terminology there but this is an a a object that I'm using as a replacement for my actual database and what I'm doing here is that I have a field in my mock store here that is a function so I have a field that is a function. So I can assign new functions to it. So that means, and then in this implementation of this uh, this uh, interface, I would just return whatever uh, the get func returns. This is actually quite useful because this allows you to, uh, in your test case here, you can. It's right in the in the scene there. This allows you to. Uh, define custom behavior of your database in your specific test. So in this case, you would say that, well, when, when the handler or my code or my application rather tries to access this key value store, it will return er key not found. So I can test the case for when when the key is not in the store, and I will make sure that is uh, a state is not found is returned by the actual HTTP server. So that's a quite powerful thing to to be able to control my dependency from test to test. And so obviously in, in, uh, in your actual application or your, your binary, you would use the actual, the, the real implementation that has like SQL queries in it, for example, or actual code that uses like your, the Redis client or something like that. And then uh, you would have to, uh, if you want to actually try out or test that your SQL queries are running, then you might just have to boot up that uh, Postgres uh, container or if you're using Docker, for example. But somehow you need to test that SQL query and, and um, you might not be able, or at least I haven't found a good way to test like SQL queries in without actually having a SQL database. Um, so, I was actually going to uh, show you this in, in my example here. So 
in this case, I have a something called a Okay, so uh, in this repository, I have at root level, I have my domain objects or like my my um, my core object, my core functionality, like the, my domain logic. So I have in this application, I have something called a product, a line item, and uh, a line item is basically this product. But you can say how many of these products I want to put in my order, basically. And then I have an order that has a status, and then a bunch of line items. And it's it's some some of these methods are to add uh, stuff to your shopping cart basically, and then to get a total um, what's the cost of the, my order. And then down here, in my root uh, directory or root root package, if you will, uh, I define this interface that is an order repository. So this uh, le this is a domain. Um, domain object that is uh, defining how I retrieve users and how I save users. But in, at this point, I'm not, I don't care about how they are actually persistent in a database. In my domain, in my, like, as a shopping cart user, I don't care about if it's Postgres, for example. I just know that there's a way I can save user or orders and you know, retrieving orders again. Sorry, not users. Um, and then this is actually a, a pattern that I'm using a lot, uh, is that you have your interface in the root directory of your application. And then you would have uh, these, for example, these two packages that contain concrete implementations of that interface. So in here, for example, I would have the code for, uh, so, so here you see my excellent SQL uh, knowledge. Um, but yeah, basically this is to, to open up a, uh, a SQL connection, basically. Uh, so, but I, we won't uh, go into detail on that one. Um, what's more interesting, though, is the the mock package, because this is the uh, the implementation that I showed you before. So in this case, I have a repository that has these functions as fields, and they will just return whatever the function that is given to them returns. Uh, so this means that this package is a concrete implementation of that repository, which I can use then in uh, when I test my, my server here, for example. So if I click uh, the, go to definition for the server, it, uh, my server has two, um, right. Uh, so basically this handler here that lists orders. So when a, a get request comes in and try to list all the orders, um, at some point here, yeah. So here I try to, uh, try to access uh, a order based on the ID. Uh, but again, they this will actually, um, this will, uh, will go to the interface here. So here we, we're, we don't know how to save it, right? Uh, but in the test here, then we can use the, the mock uh, object that we uh, defined earlier, for example, here. And then we can say, well, when, when we try to retrie retrieve this order, we get a, a order not found, basically. But we could just as easily have returned an actual order for our test case. So it's, it's, a, it's a very versatile way of, of, um, of um, mocking away uh, dependencies and no um, frameworks, no actual libraries that does this for it. This is all Go, this is all standard library, which is a very powerful thing. Uh, I, I don't have to introduce new uh, dependencies into my application in order to do stuff like this. Um, any questions so far? I know this, this is a complicated thing. I really need more time to explain it more thoroughly. Um, but again, uh, the, the, the repository is there, it's public. Uh, you can head over there after this presentation um, to check this more in more detail, for example. Let's get out of here. It's my signal. Uh, okay, so 
actually, uh, let's put, I'm not, friend of order. So, uh, next up, uh, you might have actually seen the, uh, this pattern in the test I just showed you, but now we're actually moving on to specific testing. So, uh, what I've shown you so far is just uh, general testing in general. So, uh, in this case, we might want to test like specific things like a web service. So, you might have, um, like I uh, mentioned earlier, you might have a, a HTTP server that implements this serve HTTP method that I showed you. And the, the, the serve, actually, if I show you that one, uh, actually, so it, you, you have this method that accepts a response writer ah, and a request. So this means that uh, this uh, method can receive uh, HTTP traffic. And this is uh, this is just a, a uh, like a struct or an object. You can create the request yourself, but this one uh, might be uh, difficult. This is actually an interface, so you can do your mock implementation of a response writer to to capture the the response body and the status code that you return, basically. Uh, but th since this is a very common thing for people to want to test. There's actually a package in the standard library called HTTP test that provide you with this mock implementation of uh, response writer, and it's called a uh, new recorder, or it's called a recorder, and you get a new one using that function basically. And so you create that one, and then you pass it to your handler here. So this is the 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 first argument is your response writer, and then the request, and in this case, I want to check that if I do a GET request to this endpoint, um, I want it to be OK. So here I can actually, after you've run uh, your handler with the, re the recorder, you can check the, the actual status code of that request. So you, you can, you can uh, figure that out after you actually uh, handle the request. And you can check that I want it to be OK, or I want it to be not found, or I can, yeah. You get the idea. But not only that, we can find the actual response body. So what did our, uh, our server actually return to us uh, from this handler? Uh, this is really neat, actually. This is I'm using this a lot. Since we're using microservices with uh, oh, JSON over HTTP, this is used a lot uh, in, um, in our company. Um, and I mean, Depending on your philosophy regarding like at what level you should test, you could do basically all your tests at this level. So just like to to do basically, um, I'm looking for um, um, acceptance testing. Uh, so you can do access, acceptance testing basically with with this at this level. So just saying that, well, given this re request, I'm expecting this response. And whatever else happens, I don't care about. Um, I usually, I, for my most common use cases, I do like at this level, but um, I, I guess you could do it like a more complete uh, coverage using um, uh, HTTP test uh, package. And um, yeah, so if we look at that one, uh, yeah, so same thing here. Um, so in the case where we're returning order not found from the re order repository, the database will return order not found. Then uh, here I'm, I'm creating the recorder and then, um, actually I'm doing like this, and then I'm checking the code here that, well, if the order wasn't found, I want a status code of 404, basically. Cool. So that's testing your server. But what about applications that make outgoing requests? Right? It, when, you, when you're making a request to an actual server somewhere, you might retrieve like access tokens or um, other stuff that your application requires. Uh, so there's actually a, 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 um, something in the test package for you as well, for that purpose as well. 
and it's called a test server. In this case, you there's a function called new server inside the HTTP test package. And this will actually start up a real uh, web server. This will bind to an actual address on your local machine. So this is an actual web server. Uh, and once you've created it, you can access the, the server by the field URL. So this will actually be a working URL that you can make requests to. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I have written a client that makes, uh, so it's, it's a convenience package so that I don't have to write HTTP requests. I can use a Go library instead to, to, to abstract the, the REST API away, which is basically what I'm doing. But what if um, that API is down or I, don't, I might not want to test uh, against the actual API in my tests. So in this case, I, I can um, enter the URL uh, of the, this local test server as my base URL for the client. And then I can say that, well, when I make a request to this server, I want this to execute, basically. And then I can return like um, predefined responses from that server. Um, again, so if for this, um, so where I, where I'm at right now, this main.go, this sets up like a, a web service. This is running somewhere, I've deployed it to production, and now I'm actually writing code that will query that API. So then I have this client package that uh, is actually, so it's um, accessing, or actually I can show you here. So to access an order from the REST API, I create this request and then I, I, I make the request using an HTTP client from the standard library. And I check some stuff whether or not it's a correct status code or not, basically. Uh, but if I want to test this, I would have to make an actual HTTP request. So for the client here, the test here, then I would instead um, actually, yeah, so in this, for example, so when I'm trying to access an order that is not there, then uh, I want to test when, when the actual API responds with a, a status not found. And then I want to have like a, this more proper error, um, go error instead. Uh, obviously I could just uh, encapsulate the actual status code and return that as well, uh, but in, in, not in this case. Um, yeah. So again, um, uh, this is to abstract away the actual uh, server. Yeah, as I'm hinting down here, um, you might want to return a more like complex response from this mock web server, for example. Um, and so the next testing pattern is fixtures. And a fixture is, how many in here have heard the word fixture before? Okay, a fixture is this, um, uh, like it's a test input, but it's a very more complicated test input, you could say. So you want to uh, maybe load it from file, for example. If you have a very complicated JSON that you want to try or test against, you might want to load that as a fixture inside your application instead of actually like um, making like a, um, um, like writing code for it. So you want to load that JSON instead. Then you can actually in your mock server you can read a file. Uh, from disk and then have it. Uh, so in this case, I'm reading the content of a, a, a JSON file and then uh, re return writing it here. So th that one is returned instead. This is actually a, a very nice pattern, and it's uh, it's it's um, it made it's made possible because when your or when you run your tests, each test will have the current directory set to uh, the, the location of the test. 
So when you try to access your the file system inside your test, uh, you can access it. So it's relative to that test. And so you can create this directory called test data. And why test data, you might ask? Well, um, it turns out that test data is actually being ignored by the Go tool. So if you, if you name a directory in your source code, test data, that will be ignored by the Go tool. So if you write go build or go, uh, go test, it won't even go into that directory. So if you're, if you're writing, for example, a tool uh, that parses go code and you want to parse it, uh, I don't know, like um, uh, code that won't compile, right? Uh, then you, you don't want the go tool to actually try to build that file. So that's a typical fixture that you want to load, but it's supposed to be broken. That's why you want to test it. Uh, so that, then you can you can put it inside uh, this uh, test data directory and then load it from your test case basically. And you can do this for a lot of cases. You you might imagine that if you have a binary format, for example, uh, that might be difficult to set up in your code. So it might be easier to just load it from file the actual like binary file. Um, Cool. I do have. I mean, you you get this by now. I'm, I'm, um, so that's what you saw here. So I'm actually. Um, so here, yeah, exactly. Exactly. In my tree here, I have this JSON response. So this is what I'm expecting the server to return to me uh, when I make my my test request here. Um, Actually, removing that one like that. So yeah, uh, you obviously I could have uh, had the code in here as well, or like created inside the test, but uh, it might be just easier to. And I mean, you can imagine if you if you come across. Uh, um, like behave, certain behaviors of, of the REST API that you want that makes your code break breaks your code actually, then you might want to save that response as a regression test may, maybe for example. Um, so then you could start like saving those JSON uh, responses and then making sure that all of them work in the future. So uh, some mixed goodies before I wrap up. Uh, there is an option to uh, to uh, test your um, test for race con race conditions uh, when you're running your tests. This this has actually caught a few of of, uh, of um, a few bugs in my code actually, especially when I when I'm uh, I used used to um, have a a share or no in my web server I had this map. And I was like using it to to um, as a as a store basically or a database, so in memory database basically as a like a hash map, and that would actually complain because the the built-in uh, map implementation is not thread safe. Um, so so that that is, uh, is good to know. There is one now. Uh, I think it's called Sync Map. It's in the Sync package. Yeah. Uh, so that that could be interesting to look at. But um, so that will call and get this. And if you haven't seen this notation, that might be handy as well. If you uh, if you type um, dot slash dot dot dot, that will recurse all your packages uh, uh, down basically. So if you want to in your in your um, um, like CI build, for example, you want to test all the packages that you have, and then you that you would use that one. Um, so this is actually straight straight out of our uh, CI build, and like I showed you before, you can also like choose which test to run. Basically, that is basically all I had for today. Um, so yeah, th these are uh, again these are the 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 techniques that I'm using like on a day to day basis. There are a couple of more. I mean, uh, there's a presentation by Mitchell Hashimoto 
uh, that uh, is called like advanced testing techniques or something. And he mentions a few of these, but he also mentioned a lot more um, that are, um, if I mean, they are very specific. Some of them. So if if you if you have that kind of application, it might be interesting to look at. Um, like certain ways to test specific, like networking, for example. If you if you do a lot of like TCP or UDP stuff, then it has some some cool techniques for you. I, I'm not doing a lot of those things, so uh, you get the, like the the summarized version. So, questions? Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. Um, uh, exactly. I'm letting you down here. Uh, no. Uh, so. Y there's actually built-in support for coverage. Um, there are, I mean, so what you basically do is that you generate a cover profile, and then you need to show that cover profile. I can't, for the life of me, uh, remember those lines. Um, it might be, um, but uh, since I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code, um, uh, if I do like this, I can just type uh, Command Shift P, and then T toggle test coverage in the current package, and I will get this. Uh, yeah, so uh, like, like, so go test dash cover. Oh, okay. So, but yeah. So, uh, usually I want to see like more drill down version, but but this is yeah. So this is more of a metric of your application. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I mean, the cool thing uh, you you might already know this uh, about Go is that all the editors that are available are using the same tools. I mean, you don't have to rewrite these tools for every editor. It is just binary files that uh, so you uh, each editor will just do a sub process out to the binary and uh, handle that output of that binary file. So. I mean, there's really, uh, I mean, all the cl the the um, all the uh, the editors out there that I know about has this functionality because it's in the actual Go tool. Yeah. Uh, we have. Yeah. Okay. So like that. Uh, Oh, right. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Code. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like that. Right. No. Uh, cover. No. No, 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 th this, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, right. So let's say HTML then. All oh, right, yeah. So this is a more um, like native way of doing it. Uh, so you can do this disregarding what the editor is using. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, um, built in as in built into the Go tool, or you? I uh, yeah, flame graphs. Yeah, yeah. Those are really cool. Um, we we you actually we had. Because flame graphs required to use pprof, right? I think so. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so we were using that in production actually for a while to actually have um, uh, to figure out like uh, the the the, um, the duration of our functions in production. So that's actually quite nice. And um, I I don't know if that's uh, changed from earlier, but uh, I remember that pprof is actually considered safe to use in production, so you can like instrument your your application like that. And uh, for those of you who don't know about pprof, is this uh, really nice way of um, basically tracing your application um, 
to, to figure out what's taking so long. So it, you will get, and uh, so if you, so flame graph, I can't remember what. Uh, so you get something like this. So where you have your main functions basically uh, as one of these bottom ones, then you have uh, for every function call, you get more and more detailed basically. So here we can see that most of the time is spent in this execute command, which feels natural, uh, but then you can start optimizing for, uh, for what you spend time on. And this is also, um, this is more like pprof stuff actually, um, but yeah. Cool, good, great questions, good points as well. Um, there is a lot of tools. I, this is one of the things I really love about Go is that it's, I mean, there's tools heaven. There are so many tools for written for Go. Uh, you, you have no idea. Um, I'm constantly finding new ones all, every day. Uh, so that's cool. Cool, that's all I had. Thank you. <laughs>